Kobe Shoya. Kobe is from electrical, electrical engineering, and he was a little bit worried that he doesn't have anything bio, so now it's corrected and he does have some bio. <laughs> but just a bit. Okay. Thank you very much, Yael. So, my name is Kobe Shoyer. I'm from the school. Someone. So, my name is Kobe Shoyer. I'm from the School of Electrical Engineering. And what I'm going to show you today is what uh, we do in nanophotonics which is a research field which size really does matter. So starting with a uh, quick introduction about what nanophotonic it is, showing a bit about its history, what we do today, focusing on our activity here at the University in the short summer. Okay, so what is nanophotonic? If we open up a dictionary or a, a Wikipedia, we're probably going to see something like this. Generation, detection, and manipulation of light using nanometer scale structure and speech. Sounds quite impressive. What does it really mean? Now, uh, let's just start with a brief understanding what is special about nanotechnology. So, the word nano comes from the word Greek nanos, which means a dwarf. Note the similarity to the uh, Hebrew word. And um, what happens is that at the nanoscale, the properties of material becomes very, very different from the properties of macroscopic scale. Things like the color, the conductivity, refractive index, all the properties that we know of for uh, materials becomes completely different when we're looking at matter which with size of nanometer. Let's, just for example, uh, the color of anything, say a piece of gold or silver, okay, depends on its material. Now, color has a characteristic length known as the wavelength, okay? And for visible, uh, what we can see is somewhere between 400 nanometer and 700 nanometer. Now, what would be the color, let's say a small nanoparticle which is just, just 20 nanometer long, uh, in radius? Okay, this sounds kind of weird, and intuition would say that, well, light would actually wouldn't be able to interface, interact, or to see this nanoparticle. So this intuition is quite wrong, and as I mentioned before, at the nanoscale, size matters. So why are we interested in nanophotonics? There are many things that we can do with nanophotonics. One of the most uh, promising uh, idea of nanophotonics is the ability to engineer artificial or unnatural materials. They're known as metamaterials. These materials have properties which are unnatural. They do not exist in, uh, in nature at least not as far as I know, and I will talk about them a little bit later. Uh, having the ability to make extremely small device, devices allow us to squeeze a lot of functionality into small scales and make, make more and more complex, complex uh, let's say, optical processors. And then there are many interesting applications, which, let's say, more down to earth. We can do imaging, imaging at resolutions which are far beyond what we can do with optical microscopy, for example. We can control properties of metal which has been considered for decades to be untouchable. We have the ability to make extremely sensitive sense so we can disguise and cloak things and we can do many and many more exciting things. So, what's the key physics here? The key physics here is, well, it's not very simple but it's not very complicated. It has to do with working with metals. And when light and matter interact at specific condition, there is a phenomena which can or cannot emerge depending on the circumstances, circumstances which is known as a surface plasma. So let's see what it is. It's a unique mode of interaction of light and a metallic particle. So uh, let's say we have, well, this is not a spherical cow. This is a real uh, nanoparticle. So let's, have, let's say we have a metallic particle. It has... It's uh, relatively unmovable ions, which are more, uh, positively charged, and the cloud of electrons, which are negatively charged. Now, when I illuminate this uh, particle with some, uh, uh, some kind of light or electromagnetic radiation, the, uh, uh, the electric field 
exert a force on this a, um, a electron cloud, and they start to move. Now, if you hit it just in the right frequency, or if, if we're talking about light, at the right color of light, this whole cloud of the, of the electron will start to oscillate collectively. This phenomena is called a surface plasma, or actually it's a localized plasma. And what happened here is that when I hit the particle in that frequency, it sucks in all the power in the electromagnetic wave from a cross-section which can be order of magnitude larger than the actual size of the nanoparticle. Now, if you want to think of it, it's very similar to uh, what you see or what you do when you uh, swing your child or your nephew in the, in the playground. If you time your swinging with the, uh, correctly with the, let's say, natural frequency of the swing, you can build up the amplitude very nicely. But if you try to swing it too fast or too slow, you will, be, you will barely move the whole thing. Okay? So this is a resonant phenomenon, and this is, let's say, the, the basic um, idea behind nanophotonics and plasmatics. So, um, a bit about plasmatics and photonics. Um, this resonance phenomena that uh, I've been talking about, uh, and especially the frequency or the color of light which interface with this particle, depends on the composition or the type of material that we use, but also on its size and the shape. Uh, for example, uh, when we hit the particle in the right frequency, it absorbs all the, all the energy, very similar to what happens in antennas, okay, at uh, radio frequencies, the same antennas that they, you have on your cars and maybe and may, well, used to have on your, on your cell phone, except that instead of working with microwaves and radio frequency, we, we work with light. Just as an example, what we see here is uh, a, uh, what happens when we take a, a, some kind of a, a solution of nanoparticles uh, inside uh, some kind of a liquid. The type of material in each one of these uh, canisters is the same. It's the same, uh, in this case, semiconductor. The only difference is the size. Okay? And as you can see, it glows in different colors. Why? Because what determines this frequency that makes this uh, color is the dimensions of the nanoparticle, not the composition. A little bit about the history. So uh, we think about nanotechnology and nanophotonics as very new field, but it has very long uh, uh, and uh, history uh, going back to the medieval. For example, uh, all the nice um, windows and in, in the cathedral in Europe are based on this technology. Stained glass are made by taking glass and mixing it with a small amount of nanoparticle, and the color, that, the, these beautiful colors are made by the composition and size of these nanoparticles. I think the most famous uh, demonstration for this, this sort of technology is this cup from the 4th century. When illuminated from the outside, it appears to be green, but when it, it is illuminated from the inside, it appears to be red. This is because the glass here is mixed with a very uh, small um, concentration, low concentration of nanoparticle, which um, scatter green light very efficiently. Nevertheless, as I was pointed out by, uh, by a colleague of mine recently, the history of nanophotonics can be traced back to the age of the Bible. Specifically, uh, the episode of the Golden Calf, uh, Book of Exodus, chapter 32. If you recall, Moses goes down from Mount Sinai and see uh, all the children of Israel uh, you know, celebrating around this Golden Calf, and he owed them, so he takes the calf, burn it, ground it into powder, mix it with water, and make them drink the water. So what we have here, we have a solution of water with very tiny nano, gold nanoparticle, which probably gave this water this reddish blood-like color that uh, we know about. Okay, so uh, that's the history. And uh, today we have better technologies of making glasses have color. And I think that golden cups are way out of fashion. So this uh, uh, application is also kind of rather absolute. So what do we do today with uh, nanophotonics? One of the interesting things you can do is this artificial materials or metamaterials, which I'm talking about. Like conventional materials have a property which is known as a refractive index, which is generally positive and larger than one. Now, by mixing or patterning these materials with sub-wavelength, nanometer scale, metallic uh, structure, we can modify this. We can actually make the um, uh, materials and devices 
where the refractive index in, is negative. Just to understand what it means, we all know that if we put a straw inside, a, let's say, a glass of water, the straw looks like it's broken. This is the uh, well-known phenomenon of, of a, a refraction. If this, this cup of water had a negative refractive index, it would look something like this. Very, very different. What can you do with it? Quite a lot. For example, one of the maybe most uh, interesting applications in the field of metamaterials and photonics is cloaking. There are uh, many kind of, uh, let's say, devices, things, that we would like to hide, make them invisible in at certain frequency, like this uh, stealth fighter over here. And the way we do that is by making light flow around these objects. So as, it, as light impinges our, our object, we can make it flow around it. It never touches it, and the whole thing becomes transparent. Actually, you all know how this can be done. You know, I'm sure you're all familiar with the uh, phenomenon of Fata Morgana. What happened here is that we have different layer with different uh, temperature. Each layer of air has different refractive index. Ray comes from these three are bended, reaching the eyes of the observer, or observer over here. As a result, whatever is here is practically invisible to our uh, observer. So uh, this is a, re a relatively a limited application of uh, cloaking, but if we play it right and we control the refractive index very nicely and we can get these negatively uh, refractive index material, we can probably make a, a Harry Potter-like disappearing uh, cloak or invisibility cloak. All right. So nanotechnology and nanophotonics could do miracles, but it also has more down-to-earth application. Um, one of the applications I'm going to show here, I think you're all familiar with. Some of you have probably have been using it as well. And another reason that I'm showing it is in order to be a little bit uh, kind of biocompatible with all the previous speakers as well as the next one. Uh, this is the well-known pregnancy test. This additional red line over here is caused by a plasmonic effect generated by bonding of metallic nanoparticle when the uh, specific protein, which indicates pregnancy, exists in the urine. So, as you can see, we can do miracles, but we can also do very simple but important things. So, what do we do here in nanophotonics? Uh, our field is focused on something which is called nano antenna. Like conventional antennas, our nano antennas are very small and very uniquely shaped nanostructure, which are, uh, allow us to interface with light. It's not in the RF regime or the millimeter wave regime, but in optics. Uh, here you see some examples for, for our nano antenna, just to get an impression about the size. The length of each one of these guys is about 400 nanometers, the, thick, the width is about 90, and the little gap over here is about 20 nanometer in length. What we can do with it? We have numerous attractive and exciting applications, such as new and uh, efficient and inexpensive solar cell. We can make frequency selective surface, which is something that I'm going to show in the next slide. We can make, oops, sorry, novel light sources, ultra sensitive sensors and detector for um, a, a security uh, applications, and more and more. So I'm going to focus and briefly talk about the solar panels and the frequency selective surface. In the solar panels, we are trying to take something like this. This is a very large a solar plant in the Mojave Desert, in, the, in, Calif in uh, not in California, actually, in uh, Nevada. So we try to do this, but make it very, very small. And how do we do that? The key component is something that we call a rectenna. So a rectenna is a combination of two components. It's a nano antenna and a rectifying element. And the idea is the following. Our antenna, like the antenna in your uh, radio, can absorb the electromagnetic energy and induce AC current. The rectifier basically is a component which does what your AC to DC converter at home does. They take the AC current, which the antenna has, and convert it to uh, direct current electricity. Here we see a, an image of, so, oh, sorry, of image of something like that. Okay? These are the, uh, electrical, the uh, metallic pads of the nano antenna. And the small thing connecting between them is a carbon nanotube, okay, which acts as a rectifying element. Uh, this type of uh, devices can form wonderful solar cells with efficiency that could be 
much higher than conventional solar cell, and the fabrication is much, much cheaper than what we can do today. The other applications is what we call a frequency selective surface. These are, I call them intelligent surfaces, okay? And they consist of uh, generally transparent surfaces coated with complex metallic uh, structures. This uh, structures allow us to uh, control and manipulate the shape and the frequency of the beam which uh, hits this interface. And they basically, they allow us to fold and mold the light in any way that we want. The applications are numerous, starting with ultra-thin and ultra-light wide-band lenses and mirrors. It is very important for uh, laser radars, uh, a, uh, computer displays or TV displays, which are becoming a huge market uh, uh, in these days. And I can go on and on and on, but I think my time is a little bit up, right? So let me summarize. So the message I would like you to take home with you is the following, that first, nanophotonic is a really different type of optics, okay? And it offers many ways and approaches for new and exciting uh, applications. Uh, on, the, the, on the drawback, it requires currently uh, the cutting edge fabrication technologies. But in my opinion, at least, it's one of the most exciting fields today in physics and engineering. And last but not least, it's not a buzzword. Okay, there are real and deep physics behind it. And uh, in my opinion, in the next decade or two, we are going to gain a lot by investing in this field. Finally, I'd like to thank my, my group and my students over here, my collaborator and their students, which actually do all the job, and you for listening. Thank you very much.